about building a implementation of Git in Golang. So, Aditya, over to you. Can we have a hand, please? Thank you. Okay, you all can hear me. Yes. Um, it's so great to see so many people here excited to talk about uh, Git and Go. Uh, my name's Aditya. Uh, I work on the risk and systems team at Stripe. I work primarily on monitoring infrastructure. And I've been writing Go full-time now for uh, nearly five years. I'm here to talk about a project called GitGo, which is an open source, clean room implementation of Git in Go. So how many people here uh, use Git regularly? Right. Nearly everyone. How many of you would call yourselves Git experts? Yeah, that's about it. I asked the same question at Gotham Go back in November, and uh, everyone said that they use Git regularly, and when I asked if they're experts, everyone put their hands down except for Russ Cox. So there are a number of reasons that we decided to write Git Go. It allows us to perform Git operations from Go applications. It's also more portable because it's written in Go, and it's simpler code because, it's, again, it's written in Go instead of C. But most importantly, why not? Why not rewrite Git and Go? Rewriting Git and Go gives us a tremendous opportunity to transcend some of the limitations of C and to rethink the design of the software and therefore to rethink what we can even do with it. So I'll share with you a little secret. Um, Git wasn't actually originally intended as a version control system. It was originally intended to be a file system for people to build a version control system on top of. And then it turned out that Git itself made a pretty good version control system, and so they had it and they just kept it. But it's right there in the man page if you look. Git is the stupid content tracker. It's not the stupid software tracker, the stupid source control tracker. It's the stupid content tracker. And so when we talk about uh, it get performing Git operations from Go, Go source code, I don't just mean interacting with source code, though that's definitely a big part of it. In other words, we can think of Git as a user land file system for a, de sorry, a decentralized user land file system that can preserve historical data and synchronized state. So when you look at it that way, these are also some of the things that we can use uh, Git Go for in Go. We can use the Git file system for enabling a backup system or content management. We can create a distributed build system or have a lightweight protocol for establishing consensus. We can synchronize uh, intermediate build states and use binary diffs for performance there. And so some of these applications that I'm talking about are already in use using Git Go. And so this talk could just as easily have been titled writing a distributed build system in Go or writing a file system in Go. And so if any of these applications that I'm talking about sound interesting to you, come take a look at Git Go. Git and Go are probably the two most important pieces of software for every Go programmer out there. And Git Go is a great way to really get to know their ins and outs. But today, I'm going to talk about five discoveries that we made while writing Git Go, which are relevant to all Go projects. And they all relate to the way that interfaces work in Go, both interface types and interfaces as a software design pattern. So just so we're all on the same page first, um, have you ever seen a, like, a friend whose computer looked like this? Like lab project, lab project backup yesterday, day before, et cetera. You know, I know no one here would do anything like that. It would, it would definitely be a friend. But it looks silly and we might laugh at it, but that's almost exactly what Git is doing for us. If you use Git, you may know that commits are referenced by using their SHA-1 hash, which looks something like this. And you may have actually have seen the news a couple of days ago that Google announced they found the fir very first uh, SHA-1 hash collision. And that's prompted a discussion about what Git would need to do in order to migrate away from uh, SHA-1 because um, it's not easy. Git uses SHA-1s for everything. And that's because Git really only knows one entity, and that's the Git object. The object comes in three different flavors, and uh, commits are one, but it's only one object or one entity that Git is aware of. So the actual information in a commit, like the commit message, uh, that's all stored in the .git slash objects directory. And it's zlib compressed, but if we decompress it, the, uh, the contents are human readable. It may be a little small, I apologize, and hard to read, but um, you can try this yourselves at home. Uh, you, as you can see, or may be able to see, you can see the basic things like the commit message and you know, the parent, the author. Um, but the very first line gives us 
another SHA. It says tree, and then you know, it gives us another SHA right there. And so if we look at the, ob if we zlib decompress the, uh, the tree object that that refers to, which is, which is your directory tree, 4659AEC, we then get a list of blob objects. Again, I'm just zlib decompressing the file that's right there in your repository directory. This all says blob and then a list of SHAs there. And so let's, if we take one of those blob objects and zlib decompress the object that it, uh, that it refers to, then we just get the file, right, uh, the full contents of the file right back. And that's because whenever we do a git commit, git is taking a snapshot of all of the files in our directory and stuffing them into the .git slash objects directory. But the, the key thing to note here is that the file name is not actually contained in that blob object, and that's by design. If you have two different files that are identical, or if the same file doesn't change between two commits, then they're going to share, that they can share that same object. You don't need to duplicate it. So git objects can be commit objects, tree objects, or blob objects. And commits and trees can both refer to other objects, and it recurses all the way down until you get to your blob objects, the actual files that you care about. And now a lot of people think that git stores diffs, and that's actually not true. Git doesn't store anything that remotely resembles uh, the diffs that you, that you interact with. When you do git diff or git log dash p, those are all generated or regenerated on the fly. And that's why checking out a branch in git is so fast. Git isn't reconstructing the entire uh, version history to give you your file. It just needs to see which blob objects are referenced by a given commit and then copy those back into your directory. So re-implementing this part in Go is pretty easy. I mean, uh, Go already supports zlib uh, decompression, and as you can see, the, uh, the actual contents are, are human-readable and straightforward to parse. So our first discovery from this may not be much of a surprise. Layered interfaces are more flexible and more type-safe than union types. So as you saw already, Git stores everything using objects, but there are different kinds of objects. And in C, this would be implemented using union types. But, in, but since we're using Go, we can do better than that. In Go, we use interface types. And if we layer our interface types in Go, we get all of the same flexibility of union types in C, but we get the additional type safety that Go gives us. And so interfaces mean that we can parse objects not based on what they are, but based on how they behave. And by layering them, we can do this in stages. We don't, we don't have to do it all at once. And so that's similar to how the I.O. interfaces work in the standard library. You see you have readers and writers and seekers, and some types might implement all three of those, but some might only implement one or uh, might only satisfy one or two. And so the way that we do this in Gitgo is we have uh, the Git object, which is one interface, and then we have the tree-like interface, which gives us anything that has a SHA. And so the tree interface is a third one, which just combines a Git object and tree-like. And by the way, if you're raising an eyebrow at the naming of tree-like, that's actually not me, that's Git. Uh, Git has this concept internally of tree-ish, uh, and I just couldn't bring myself to name something tree-ish, and so it's, it's actually tree-like. Uh, but, that, but that's Git for you. And so at first, we started by uh, implementing object parsing by bootstrapping Git Go, using the actual Git object stored in the repository for our tests. And that sounds like a pretty reasonable idea. I mean, as long as you're not rebasing or force pushing, you know, the Git history is going to be immutable, right? And that's wrong. The history that Git represents is immutable, but the way that Git stores that history might actually change. So if you have a, if you have a SHA that references either a commit or a blob, you can always count on that blob being stored somewhere in your repository, but, it's not, but it may not always be stored in the same way. Specifically, Git has a custom-built compression algorithm for handling binary diffs. And you might be thinking, well, he just said a moment ago that Git doesn't store diffs. And that's true. Git isn't storing anything that's like the diffs that you would ever see or, or, or interact with. But it does have its own way of compacting objects to reduce the redundant information that it needs to store. So, Git already uses hashes to deduplicate blob objects that are 100% identical. But if even one single byte is different, then the hashes won't match. So in this example, you know, we start off with I love Go. 
and we can hash that. But then if we get really excited about it and say, I love Go, and add an exclamation mark to it, it's going to hash to something completely different. That's the way hashes are supposed to work. And so if we make lots of small changes to the same files over and over again, every single change is going to be uh, hashed to a separate value. That's going to be a separate blob object. And that's going to be a lot of duplicate data that we're storing. And if you think about that for a moment, you'll realize that's a pretty bad property to have in a version control system because version control is all about making lots of small changes to the same files over and over again. And so to solve this, whenever you push or pull a branch, Git will essentially garbage collect these duplicate chunks within objects by storing them in a special file that's called a pack file. You might notice this when you clone or, or pull a repository. It'll say unpacking objects. That's what it's referring to. A pack file is a double layered compression scheme that stores these binary diffs. And again, these are not the diffs, these diffs don't represent diffs necessarily between commits. They just are binary diffs that are dynamically generated and regenerated whenever you push and pull branches. It's actually done to uh, reduce network usage, not even uh, storage on disk, originally, anyway. So I could talk for you know, many hours about pack files, and so if anyone's interested, interested in the gory details, um, come find me afterwards, I'll talk your ear off about them. Uh, but if you're interested in, uh, in learning more, you can also check out uh, two articles that I wrote on the topic. One is called Unpacking Git Pack Files, and the other is Implementing Git's Compression Algorithm in Go. But for today, I just want to give a taste of what's involved because it will get, bring us to the second and third discoveries that we made about Go and about interface types in Go. So let's say that we had these three strings and we wanted to deduplicate them. We'd store the first one, and then for the second one, we'd say, well, you know, it's the first string, but with an exclamation mark added. OK, that's fine. We can match prefixes. But for the third string, the you love Go and so do I, that it shares some common components with the string I love Go, but it's not as simple as prefix or suffix matching. We need to use a binary diffing function that will tell us the shortest, uh, the shortest way to relate that third string to the first two. And so Git has a custom-built algorithm for determining what this shortest function is going to be. And unlike this simple example, the real pack file algorithm is content agnostic. It doesn't assume that we're dealing with plain text. It can handle any sort of content. So once we do this and we have uh, those three different um, relations, or the descriptions of the relations, whoops, we just zlib compress each component individually and then concatenate them all into a pack file. And there you have it. You've, you've packed your pack file together. But pack files give us an important discovery about Go. We have to pay attention to the contracts of the interfaces that we're using, because there's actually a small gotcha that's hidden inside the reader interface. So the zlib file format is prefix synchronized, and that means that you can append arbitrary data to the end of any zlib file, and it doesn't change how it gets decompressed. Any zlib decompressor will just keep reading until it's able to reconstruct an entire file, and then it'll ignore everything after that. And so that arbitrary data that you append to the end of a zlib file could be anything. It could even be another zlib file. And you might have guessed this a moment earlier. Git takes advantage of that by concatenating all of the different zlib objects together. And so we could just start at the beginning and keep reading until we got a zlib object and then know that the very next byte starts our next object, and that's how we would parse our pack file. And we would just rinse and repeat. We'd get like this linked list of zlib objects. It would be very lisp-like and beautiful. But we actually can't do this because Go's zlib reader is non-exact. It might actually read more data than it truly needs in order to reconstruct the file. So once we've read the first object, we don't really know where to begin reading the next because we might have read the first few bytes of the next file already. And there's no way of knowing how much data was, was, uh, was really read. Now you might be thinking again, well, but the read method, uh, you know, that's the contract. It gives us the number of bytes that was read from the underlying reader. And that's actually not true. Read returns a number, but that's the number of bytes that's written into the buffer that you provide. And you mu for many readers, that's going to be the same thing. But we're talking about compression. Hopefully, the number of bytes in your compressed version is going to be different from the number of bytes in the uncompressed version. Otherwise, you don't have a very good compression algorithm. And read gives us the number of uncompressed bytes. But that's not what we need. We need the number of compressed bytes read from the actual file. And the zlib reader, to make matters worse, does its own internal buffering. 
So even if you wrap it within, with your own buffer, it still could be reading more data than you need. So it turns out that parsing Git pack files would be a lot easier if we had um, access to this information somehow. Um, but since we don't, we end up parsing pack files by using another type of file altogether, which I won't get into, but it's the index file. It basically tells you where each object starts. And there is actually a second way to solve this problem. Um, if you're interested, um, ask me afterwards. I can tell you the trick. But Go isn't alone in this. The typical C libraries for uh, zlib decompression are non-exact. Um, Rust also uses a non-exact zlib reader. In fact, there's only one language that I'm aware of that uses an exact implementation of zlib, and that is Haskell. Um, I guess because it's, it's so lazy, it, it, it doesn't read any extra bytes. So don't get me wrong, Go's interfaces are, are great. And in going on five years, this is really the only um, surprise or frustration that I've had with them. But it's an, it, it's an interesting corner case, and it's an important lesson for us about inter interfaces in Go. They're a powerful abstraction, but sometimes there's an impedance mismatch. And we need to be careful of the contracts that they provide and that we're not reading more into them than, than really is there. Um, pun not actually intended. Our third discovery about Go involves concurrency. Concurrency is a great tool for defining state machines as, a, as an abstraction. So when we git check out a branch, there are lots of independent steps that need to happen. And some of those are completely unrelated to each other, and some are like, and only need to come together in the final, the final portion, and, and some, some depend very, very tightly on each other. So even without parallelism, concurrency is a great tool. Remember, concurrency is not parallelism. Concurrency is about decomposing your logic into independent components and defining the interfaces and invariants between those components. So as an exercise, sit down and draw out your call tree. You might end up with something like this, where you, know, you have a function and it'll branch on an if statement, and then they'll all come back together and call it the same function, but then they might branch you know, based on polymorphic typing. You, you'll end up with some nodes that, that have lots of outbound or inbound edges and some nodes that only have a few. The nodes that have lots of outbound or inbound edges are probably places where you want to use an interface to communicate. And once you've done that, the, uh, every group of nodes between two interfaces becomes, sorry, between, uh, uh, between two channels becomes its own Go routine. So concurrency lets us construct state machines that have very narrow responsibilities, like you know, reading, an in, reading an index file or extracting an object from a pack file. And when we use this approach, we can think of the channels between the Go routines that are communicating between those nodes with lots of outbound or inbound edges. We can think of those channels as invariants or our contracts. A function can say, I don't actually know whether the, uh, the object file I just read came, the, the git object I received came from a pack file or came from a raw object file, but I do know that it's a valid git object. And even if all of this happens in serial, even if we've set our go ma max procs to one, we still get the benefit of simpler code and more testable code. And if you want to try taking this to the next level, you can enforce that your channels only ever contain interface types, that they never contain concrete types. And that way, all of the implicit dependencies and the implicit coupling that you have within your code will become, uh, within your call tree, that will all become very explicit very quickly. And our fourth discovery is about the error interface. So Git uses C style error handling, which is it returns an integer status code. And that's functionally the same as doing if an error is not equal to nil. So we could do the same thing for Go, but Again, we're not using C, we're using Go. So let's take advantage of the more advanced and expressive error handling that Go gives us. We can return arbitrary information along with our error. So for example, we might encounter an error when, encounter it when reading an object from a pack file. Maybe we're fetching a repository and that's done over the network and the connection drops. So we might want to retry with a delay, but sticking that, uh, let's say this is what our call tree looks like. Sticking that delay uh, logic inside the parsing pack file function is a little bit awkward. Parsing a pack file doesn't really need to know anything about network communication. The only reason that we'd want to put it there and have it be aware of it is because the underlying implementation happens to use a, a network reader, but the delay logic, the retrial, all happens in the git fetch. So rather than sticking that in the parse pack file function, we can treat our errors as values and ask them how they behave. 
we can define a local interface type which, which looks for uh, any type that gives us a delay, uh, a, a, an interval after which we're going to retry. And then the git fetch function can ask the error that it receives, do you respond to this interface? Do you implement this interface? Do you respond? Do you give me this value? And if so, it will handle the logic accordingly. And this way, the underlying implementation, in this case, maybe the HTTP dir package, is aware of that, inter uh, of that error's uh, behavior. And the git fetch function is also aware of that, in uh, that error's behavior. But the parsing pack file doesn't need to be. It shouldn't need to know anything about network communication if it's not actually doing any of it itself. So instead of forcing tight coupling between these, we can get a, we can get a superior abstraction by asking for behavior only when we need it. And our final discovery about interfaces in, uh, involves performance. And this is just to help people get over the fear sometimes that you might have while using them. Sometimes people are afraid that, you know, if I use an interface type, um, I'm going to have to give up perf uh, my, the performance of my code. And it is true that, yes, interface types do introduce an overhead over concrete types. But in reality, if you're mindful of how you design your interfaces and how you use them, you'll actually get better performance with them because you'll be leveraging more efficient abstractions and those abstractions will be shared amongst your code. So to give you an idea, uh, for Gitgo, we made absolutely no effort up front to optimize the performance of our code. But these were the very first benchmarks that we ran on it. We were already able to load and parse over 100 Git objects every millisecond with no effort whatsoever. And so I'd like to take full credit for that. And maybe I should you know, sit and take a little bit of credit for that. But most of the credit actually really comes to the, for the interface types that we were leveraging. We were piggybacking off of existing abstractions, largely the readers and writers defined in the standard library um, and that are shared throughout the standard library and, and other third-party code. The performance comes from how we chained those interfaces together and the fact that we are able to strip out the parts that we don't need. By using our interface types and making all of our requirements explicit, making those contracts and invariants in our state machines explicit, it becomes very obvious which parts aren't actually needed anymore, and optimizing your code becomes a lot easier. So these were the five discoveries that we made about how interfaces work in Go. And they're applicable whether you're building a file system in Go, or writing a distributed build system in Go, or managing, managing source control for Go, or even if you're doing something else altogether. But if you are interested in doing any of these things, come take a look at GitGo. It's open source and it's on GitHub. And it enables us to take full advantage of the file system that Git has popularized for us and to achieve the full potential of everything that Git actually can enable us to do. Thank you. Thank you, Aditya. Do we have any questions? I see one hand here. Hi. Uh, you mentioned about distributed build systems. Yes. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, that's something that's used by um, another company, actually, uh, which I won't name just because I'm not sure that they, um, I haven't asked them to name them publicly here. But um, they are using it essentially to synchronize uh, intermediate uh, build artifacts. Um, so if you have a lot of engineers at a company who are working on um, uh, the same sorts of, uh, you know, the same projects, and um, this actually addresses the issue that Git has with, um, with scaling. You essentially need to synchronize cop parts of a repository or build artifacts that are built on parts of a repository across multiple machines, and the um, pack files turn out to be a really great way of doing that. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? No? All right. Thanks so much, Aditya. Thank you.